This is Macro Voices with hedge fund manager Eric Townsend, the free weekly financial podcast targeting professional finance, high net worth individuals, family offices, and other sophisticated investors. Macro Voices is all about the brightest minds in the world of finance and macroeconomics telling it like it is, bullish or bearish, no holds barred. Now, here are your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna. Macro Voices, episode 265, was recorded on April 1st, 2021. I'm Eric Townsend. This episode is brought to you by Abex Technologies, pioneering the design of smarter markets that better meet the needs of both market participants and society as a whole. And by Masterworks.io, bringing fine art investing within reach of all investors. We told you, our listeners, that we were running out of smart deflationists to balance the deluge of inflationists we've had on the show in recent weeks. Far and away, the deflationist requested most by our listeners was one I wasn't even familiar with previously, Stephen Van Meter. Stephen joins me as this week's feature interview guest, and the entire interview will focus on why Stephen says the outlook really still is deflationary unless and until private credit expansion returns with a vengeance. Then be sure to stay tuned for our post-game segment when Patrick's chart deck will be titled Straddling the 50-Day Moving Average. And I'm Patrick Ceresno. Now, Eric, let's jump to that S&P 500. We're north of 4,000. At least we printed up there. What's, uh, what's your take on all of this? New all-time high today, and boy, finally, it's been almost two weeks since we had one. Uh, you know, no change to my outlook. I really feel like the people that are making arguments saying these valuations are nutso and, you know, it's time for the market to crash have a very good argument. But frankly, what I see in progress is a crack-up boom in, in motion, a melt-up. And as far as I can see, that's set to continue. We'll see what happens. In any case, if I were going to play this market, I'd rather do it with straddles as opposed to a directional bet. We'll come back to that in the postgame segment. All right, well, let's move on to the dollar index because uh, the dollar generally has been uh, continuing to rise. A little bit of a pullback today, but we're still uh, straddling that 93 level on the dollar index. What's your take on this? Well, clearly this move has legs. We, we got well above that 92 resistance level that we were watching. So the question is, what happens next? But remember, it's all relative. It doesn't mean that the dollar is gaining purchasing power. Just look at gold moving up at the same time as the dollar index moving up. It's only a comparison to other currencies. It's a question of who is debasing their currency faster than the other guy. It's a race to the bottom among central bankers. And and uh, at the moment, uh, the dollar is losing the race to the bottom and, and therefore appreciating against other currencies. At the end of the day, my perspective is still, hey, it's all relative. I care more about the absolute trade, and that's definitely down for fiat currencies. Eric, let's talk crude oil. I, I mean, there was an OPEC meeting and all sorts of stuff. What's uh, going on in oil? Well, I think it was all about the OPEC meeting today and the lead up to the OPEC meeting that had lots of gyrations up and down as various rumors leaked out. To me, it's all noise. Uh, at the end of the day, Saudi Arabia's messaging is very clear. They, they want to get higher prices. They want to support the current prices. They don't think there's a need to reduce the price of oil. So any fantasies that anybody had about Saudi Arabia is not going to let the price go too high because that would allow the U.S. shale revolution to, you know, get a restart or something. That's not going on. Now, they are increasing production. Well, gee, what do you expect as you come into summer driving season in a year where a pandemic is hopefully at least winding down to some extent, regardless of whether the pandemic is really over or not? I do expect that we'll see more demand for fuel as people are going to insist on traveling and driving and having those summer vacations and so forth. So, yeah, they're increasing production. Big deal. What we saw was a whole lot of market up and down and, and scared what's going to happen next. Eventually, once the meeting was over, yep, they are going to slowly, gradually increase production over the next few months. Of course, they're going to do that. That's no big surprise to anybody. And once the meeting was over, we broke out of the trading range that we've been stuck in for the last couple of days. Got to, I guess it was about a three-day high. We didn't quite get through the 34-day 
moving average on crude oil, but we did get above all of the short-term moving averages, including the 21-day moving average on our Bob gasoline. So it looks to me like the bottom is in and maybe we're about to see the next leg higher or at least a continuation of a sideways consolidation. I don't think we have a big move down coming from here. The Texas freeze out seems to finally be over, at least from the perspective of distorting inventory information. Uh, the crude oil drawing down 876,000 barrels, and that was on the tails of API reporting a big build on inventory, which had kind of spooked the market, but then the official data came out at a drawdown of 876,000 barrels. Cushing, Oklahoma, building 782,000 barrels. Gasoline drawing down 1.7 million barrels. Distillates building 2.5 million barrels. U.S. production ticking up 100,000 barrels to 11.1 million barrels. So we're back right up to that peak level that existed before the Texas freeze-out began. It's not really clear whether we're going to stay in this consolidation or maybe it's ending now that we're past this OPEC meeting. Once we see a daily close on West Texas Intermediate, first of all, above the 34-day moving averages, which are right around $62, but then above 62 spot 55, which is the 21-day moving averages, that really would say to me the next leg higher is on. Could be that we're going to consolidate sideways for a while here longer. We'll see what happens. All right. Well, let's move on to gold because over the last couple of months, obviously gold's been incredibly weak, but uh, in the, over the last couple of days uh, has really reversed off of those March lows. Uh, do you think that's uh, anything meaningful or are you still pretty much the same on your view on gold? It definitely caught my attention, the, the exuberance of that bounce. As I predicted last week, I said, I think we're headed for another retest of that 1680 support level that Ola Hansen told us was so important. Sure enough, that's what we got. But I was expecting maybe it wouldn't hold this time and we'd keep trading lower. Instead, as you say, not only was that support level rejected, but it was a really exuberant, at least the uh, couple of daily bars that we've had so far, it, it really kind of looks to have some momentum to the upside. So the exuberance of that bounce off of 1680 kind of has me scratching my head. I thought we were headed toward still lower numbers. That still makes sense to me, frankly. I, I think there could be another $100 or $200 of downside if Treasury yields continue to back up higher, which it seems like nobody's really sure what's going on there. So I think there is plenty of scope for further downside, but the tape action last couple of days really looks like this bounce has legs. So let's come back to it next week and see how it looks. All right, Lynn, let's finally touch on the 10-year Treasury yield because at least temporarily in the middle of the week, we had a burst that, oh, to a little bit of a higher high on yields. But really, it looks like now that that one spot seven five level is at least an overhead resistance level on this 10-year yield here. Do you think that this is uh, where the yields kind of pause or do you think that uh, there's uh, still more upside on this? Patrick, I really have no idea. You know, I think everybody thought when David Tepper said the top was in, what was that, at 160 or something, that that was going to be it. And sure enough, we, we went another 10 or 15 basis points. Uh, I don't know really where this can go or how high it can go. I do think it's being driven by President Biden's fiscal spending plans and the expectation that the Treasury is going to issue a whole bunch of more bonds in order to pay for all this stuff. What we don't know yet is what the monetary response to that will be in terms of how much participation the Fed has in buying some of those bonds. So I don't know where it's headed. I definitely want to hear Stephen Van Meter's view in today's interview. Well, this week's feature interview guest is Stephen Van Meter. Now, Eric, why did we invite Stephen to the show this week? Well, I'm ashamed to admit I'd never even heard of Stephen before uh, we asked our listeners, who do you want to hear from as a deflationist to counter all of these inflationists? Most of our regular guests have turned into inflationistas, the, the term coined by Louis Vincent Gav to describe himself. And uh, it was really an overwhelming response. So many listeners wanted to hear from Stephen as their preferred deflationist. He's not the only deflationist. We've also got some of the other deflationists that our listeners have requested, including Jeff Snyder and uh, David Rosenberg. And we're still trying to get Dr. Lacey Hunt, but it looks like it's going to take a little longer to get him. So we're going to launch the deflationist campaign with Stephen this week. Eric's interview with Stephen is coming up as Macro Voices continues right after this message from our sponsor.
This episode of Macro Voices was made possible by Abex Technologies, which also sponsors the new Smarter Markets podcast, which airs every Saturday morning and explores how markets themselves could be redesigned to better serve market participants and society as a whole. My interview with Dr. Lehman Baird, inventor of Hedera Hashgraph, is available now at smartermarketspod.com. And my guest this coming Saturday morning will be Michelle Dennity, who's joining me as a host of the Smarter Markets podcast, and will also be doing some of her own interviews, starting with Jim Whitehurst, president of IBM. That one is coming up the following Saturday. But you won't get Smarter Markets on your Macro Voices feed. You have to separately subscribe to Smarter Markets in your podcast app to receive this free new podcast. And now, with this week's special guest, here's hedge fund manager, Eric Townsend. Joining me now is Stephen Van Meter from stephenvanmeter.com, also the host of his own macro YouTube channel, but most interesting to us at Macro Voices as perhaps the last deflationist standing. Uh, Not actually the only one, Stephen, but you're one of few. So why don't we start with just the the big picture? You know, a lot of us, uh, myself included, have really come around to a view that we're looking at a shift towards secular inflation. Different people think different things about how far off it is. There aren't too many of you guys left that don't see that way at all. So tell me where you want to start, either with why deflation or why not inflation? Yeah, you know, Eric, I I think it's easy to see why we should have inflation, right? I mean, housing prices are up, stock markets up, treasury is up, crude oil is up. I mean, food prices are up. I mean, it's hard not to think that we're going to see this secular rise of inflation. And yet we continue to see these deflationary pressures on the economy. And people say, well, that will go away as soon as the reopening is done. We have once people get back to work, but yet when you, when you look at this from a monetary perspective and when you really understand how quantitative easing works and its effect on the economy, what you find out is we're in a liquidity trap. And even worse, the Fed created the liquidity trap. And the problem with liquidity traps is they're disinflationary. And if they're let run too long, they become outright deflationary. And so when you understand that we're in a liquidity trap, you realize that these disinflationary pressures aren't going away. And it, the biggest risk we have then is turning into deflation. Let's start with quantitative easing, because that's something a lot of people have, in some cases, mistaken assumptions about. One of them is a lot of us in the beginning thought QE itself was going to be inflationary. We didn't really understand where that money that was being created was going. So tell us a little bit about quantitative easing, how it really works and how that differs from the way some people perceive it to work. Yeah, I think that's a great question, Eric, because you're right. We, we do have this view that it is inflationary. It's meant to cause interest rates to go up. But really, the purpose of QE is to strengthen the dollar and lower treasury yields. And what's odd about this, what people don't understand, is that QE traps money in the financial system. And you have this view that, okay, we, we can see this, right? In the M2 money supply, we see all this deposits. We see this money. We say, okay. This has to be inflationary until you find out that that money is actually trapped in the commercial banking system via QE and is not coming out. And in fact, its movements are very limited. And so what happens is QE becomes deflationary, or you could say it's disinflationary until it becomes deflationary, until there's enough lending growth because that's where dollars are created. And that's really the key here is a lot of people think QE creates money, and we'll, we'll get into that. The real creation of money is when people borrow and when a loan is originated. So if you really think about what QE is trying to do, is trying to lower interest rates, raise the dollar, get people to borrow, create money, and then you get this big pulse of inflation from that borrowing. Okay, now with respect to a historical review of how QE has worked, I agree with you completely. A lot of people, myself included, got it wrong. We thought it was going to be inflationary when it wasn't because, as you say, QE really is an asset swap. It's creating more bank reserves, but it's not really pumping money out into the real economy. So I agree with you there. But hang on a second, Stephen. That was then. This is now. And it seems to me that the big political change that we've seen 
is now all of the sudden there's a huge amount of political focus on what some people call QE for the people or helicopter money. It's not going to be another round of the same kind of QE that we've had before. It's going to be the creation of money out of thin air for the purpose of delivering stimulus transfer payments directly into John Q. Public's pocket or checking account. And that's why it is different this time. And it is going to be inflationary. Do you disagree that it's different this time? Or are we only talking about what's happened in the past? Or why don't you see the current MMT, modern monetary theory inspired desire of politicians to hand out money to the general public as not being inflationary? Yeah, I think that's really it, right? I mean, we look back to QE of old, QE 1, 2, 3, which is the same QE as we're doing now. But it's like adding a turbocharger to your car. You put fiscal stimulus, and the answer is, how can this not be inflationary? And I think the really the key step here is we need to kind of review how QE works, and then we can kind of dovetail that into how does fiscal stimulus actually play into this, and, and why did Powell go around? I mean, did people wonder why in all of these press conferences and FOMC meetings, everywhere Powell went, he was beating his drum of fiscal stimulus? Now, was it because he actually believed that fiscal stimulus is inflationary? Or is there actually a whole nother reason that most people aren't even considering? And so if you if we can, I'd like to go through how QE works just to make sure all of our listeners are on the same page, if, if that's okay with you, Eric. That's perfect, and I want to let our listeners know that Stephen prepared a chart deck to accompany today's interview. Registered users will find the download link in your Research Roundup email. If you're not yet registered, just go to our homepage, macrovoices.com. Look for the red button that says Looking for the Downloads, just above Stephen's picture and just below the green Donate button. Hit me up, Stephen. Let's talk about how QE really works. Perfect. Well, so we, we understand that QE is a reserve swap. So let's kind of reverse engineer this. And, and for those who understand, I'm not going to go too deep, but just enough to bring everyone up to speed. So when the Fed does QE, all they are doing is they're taking a bank reserve held by a commercial bank and they're swapping it for a reserve asset. And that's all the process is. But sometimes we kind of miss the part of, well, where did that bank reserve come from? How did it come into existence? And the way a bank reserve comes into existence is when you deposit money in a commercial bank. And I want you to be thinking like you know, Wells Fargo, JP Morgan, Bank of America, the big commercial banks. As this money is deposited, well, they have to pay interest on that. And there's two ways they can do it. They can either lend against that, which they're not doing a lot of, and we'll talk more about that later on. But the other way they can do it is they can take those bank deposits and buy treasury securities and use the interest from the treasury securities to pay depositors. And so that's where you get a bank reserve from, is a bank takes bank deposits, customer deposits, and creates a bank reserve. And then the Fed comes along and swaps it. Now, Eric, have you ever played the game Pac-Man? I have not. You've not, but are you familiar with it? I am familiar with it. I've seen it, but I have never played it myself. Okay. Not a video so, game guy myself. Uh, well, perfect. That, that's okay. But you understand that there's a little Pac-Man that goes around the board and eats what are called pellets, uh, snack pellets. And as Pac-Man eats these dots, it's a lot like quantitative easing. Because one thing that people don't understand is they think that quantitative easing creates the growth in the money supply when in actuality, quantitative easing needs a growth in money supply. And that's where we start to learn why Powell wanted fiscal stimulus. So what Pac-Man does, QE, is it goes around the board and it eats these snack pellets, which are effectively customer deposits at commercial banks that get converted into reserves, which then get eventually converted by QE into reserve assets. And so as Pac-Man goes around the board, the way the game is won is he eats all the snack pellets. Well, there's a problem. If QE eats all of the bank deposits then the Fed either has to stop QE or scale it back so much just to handle whatever new deposits are coming in. And so this was a challenge because the Fed was doing so much QE, they were running out of bank deposits. And, or, and they knew this end was coming. So how do you get more bank deposits when you can't create them? Well, you have to do fiscal stimulus. And you have to go out and borrow this money from non what I'll call non-M2 sources. Now, when I'm using the term non-M2 source, Eric, is I'm either referring to money outside the commercial banking system that's in the U.S. or 
money outside the United States that's not in the commercial banking system that might be held by a foreign central bank, a foreign government, a foreign insurance company that you know would look to buy treasury securities. And so what happens is the Fed needs non-M2 money to be borrowed by the U.S. Treasury and then paid out as fiscal stimulus. So American taxpayers will get that money and deposit it into the banking system, knowing that some of it will land in the commercial banking system, where then it can be converted to a reserve and then eventually to a reserve asset by QE. So the idea that QE of old and QE of new are really different. The only thing that's different is the Fed was actually going to run out of deposits for the for the QE Pac-Man to chew up and he needed some more. And that's why he really needs fiscal stimulus, not because he believes it's inflationary. Maybe he does, but he needs it to continue doing quantitative easing because you and I both know that you know, Fed Chair Powell has clearly stated we're going to run QE for several more years and maybe even longer. We don't know. Now, help me understand why this need for bank deposits exists. It seems to me QE, as I understand it, involves the Fed purchasing treasury bills. So they're buying U.S. Treasury securities from the government or from a private holder on on the free market. But one way or another, they're buying up U.S. Treasuries with money that is essentially created out of thin air by by clicking a, a button. Why do we need to have existing bank reserves in order for that transaction to occur? Because when the Fed engages in QE, they're not directly going out to the public. They cannot go to the treasury auctions. They can only purchase them from the large commercial banks who participate in the QE program. And so the only way the commercial banks are getting these treasury securities is by using customer deposits to create reserves. So you see this process where the Fed is effectively just taking customer deposits that are being turned into reserves by the banks and then swapping them. They're not going out to URI. They're not, again, not going out directly. You don't see them as bidders at the U.S. Treasury auctions. They're getting them from the large commercial banks. Okay, so to summarize your argument, Stephen, it is essentially that in order for primary dealers to be able to sell treasuries to the Fed, they need to have those treasuries, and the only way to have them is as a reflection of customer deposits. It seems to me there are other ways. We've heard stories about these large primary dealers literally front-running the Fed by buying securities, which they sell back to the Fed three days later. Do they really need to have customer deposits in order to backstop those transactions? The way I view it is the primary dealers are selling treasury securities to the commercial banks. Now, it just so happens that many of the primary dealer banks are owned by commercial banks. So we have trouble seeing that separation there. But it's the commercial banks who are then taking those treasury securities or using customer deposits to buy those treasury securities that are being swapped. So that's the way I see the process being done. Okay, and where does this leave us now as we get into this next big round of stimulus, which seems to have different political drivers behind it? We've got a new administration in the White House as well as in in Congress. Where are we headed? Well, we're clearly headed for more fiscal stimulus because in order to continue doing QE, you need more customer bank deposits. You need more of those deposits to convert into reserves, and then you need to be able to swap those reserves. So, so then the kind of the question then is, well, how do you encourage people to deposit money in the bank? How, how does that work? And why are they sitting on all this money in the bank? And that, again, now comes back to what is one of the purposes of QE is to lower interest rates. So let's say I, as an American consumer, goes down and deposits money in the bank, and, and maybe I'm just building up a reserve, my emergency account. And let's just say that number is $10,000. It's not really relevant to the size of it. And let's say over time, I've now grown that to $15,000. Well, what, what do most consumers do is they'll take the extra amount, the 5000 and they will seek to get more return on it. And it doesn't mean they're going to run out and open a brokerage account and buy stocks. It might mean they'll put their money out at a slightly longer term, maybe in a CD, maybe in some other longer term deposit. But what happens to the QE is the short term rates are suppressed so much that a consumer goes down to the bank and looks to reinvest some of that money and finds out that there really isn't much of extra interest to tie their money up. So they leave it as a deposit. 
And that's really what's critical of QE is it needs customer deposits to convert to reserves. And by suppressing interest rates, it encourages customers to keep money in the bank earning, you know, 0.1% or whatever the banks are actually paying today. Now, you argue that we're headed toward a liquidity trap. Why is that and how are we defining liquidity trap? Yeah, I, I, I want to go through before we get there a, a little bit more on what QE does in terms of you know locking down interest rates and how it traps money into the financial system, because I think it'll make more sense because people are hearing that all the time from other people that money gets tied up there. OK, well, how is it getting tied up there? So let's kind of broadly talk about how interest rates are suppressed by QE. And it all depends on the size and scope of the program. So if the Fed is focusing on the front end of the curve or the long end or broadly like they are now, well, with the exception, they're not doing T-bills right now. Well, what you're finding out is they're reducing the supply of treasuries on the market by $80 billion a month. Now, I don't know what the net new issuance is, but they're reducing the supply. And so the idea is pretty simple, is when you reduce the supply of something, you're kind of hoping to increase the value of what is remaining, and that would mean bond prices rise and interest rates fall. The other thing they're doing, Eric, which I find pretty interesting, is they're actually changing the nature or the duration of a bank reserve. So uh, let's just say for an example, a commercial bank buys a two-year treasury note. They're obviously using customer deposits. And then the Fed comes along and swaps that. Well, when that swap occurs, a two-year treasury note is now being removed from the supply. It's going onto the Fed's balance sheet. We can see it. It's accounted for there. Interest is paid to it. But we can't buy it off the Fed. We can't short it. You know, we can't go visit it. But what do the banks get in exchange? And the banks get a reserve asset, and it's an overnight duration. It effectively is a cash reserve, and it matures every day. And it pays a 0.1% interest. So it's not, you know, in a sense, overly attractive in terms of being a high interest vehicle. It's designed to reduce the duration or reduce the maturity of the bank's reserves. And when you piece that all together, you find out that, okay, this is really designed to lower interest rates. And one of the ways we can see that, and let's go to chart one, where I've got the monetary base on the left and cash assets at all commercial banks. Now, Eric, you know this, uh, the monetary base used to be bi-monthly. And then recently the Fed decided they're only going to put it out once a month, which was unfortunate for those who enjoy looking at the monetary base twice a month. We could no longer do that. But what's interesting is, in the weekly H.8 data, there is something called assets and liabilities of all commercial banks. And there is a subsection called cash assets. And that includes vault cash, cash items in the process of collection, balances due from depository institution and balances due from Federal Reserve banks. And so when you chart them together, what you see is these balances due from Federal Reserve banks. Well, there's your reserve assets that is created as a byproduct of QE. And the reason I like this is because it comes out weekly and it has a very strong relationship with the monetary base, which makes perfect sense because the monetary base is those reserve assets plus cash in circulation. So we know as cash assets at banks go up and the Fed continues to do quantitative easing that the monetary base should follow it. And if we go to the second slide where we start now looking at this effect on interest rates, because the popular belief right now is that interest rates are going up, they're going to go up substantially, and they're probably going to go up even more after that. And yet when you understand the effects of quantitative easing and this liquidity trap that we're going to get into, is it's actually designed for interest rates to go down. So what I've done on slide two, Eric, is I've inverted cash assets. And for those who are looking at these slides wondering where I created them from, these are from the St. Louis Fed Federal Reserve Database. Uh, it's free to access, so you can go on there and you can recreate these charts yourself. And you see if there's a minus sign in front of cash assets, so now I've inverted that. If you don't like using cash assets, you can certainly use the monetary base. And I've overlaid 30-year treasury yields. So we can go back and look at 2010, where you see yields rising as cash assets are flat, and then you see that hard reversal of yield. And then you see yields went back up, cash assets shown inverted now rising but going down on this chart and then you see the hard reversal of yield and then you see it again in 2013 all right here's going to be reflation you know interest rates are going to go up 
and cash assets start rising, again, shown inverted, and interest rates reverse. And now here we are again in 2021, interest rates are rising, cash assets are rising, and everyone believes interest rates are going to continue to rise. But yet, due to the effects of QE on the bond market, it suggests that no, interest rates, while they could continue to rise, are going to have a hard reversal at some point. So you're expecting that hard reversal in interest rates. What is the trigger or driver that would cause that to happen? Well, I I wish I knew exactly what that would be. At the moment, it just appears that uh, there are a lot of people shorting the bond market. A lot of people have sold bonds. No one wants to own a global government debt of any form. They believe inflation is coming. And, you know, if inflation was coming, that would probably be one of the easiest trades to make is you just simply short the bond market. But one of the challenges is, as we'll get into, is the monetary system eventually rejects higher yields because there's not a lot of demand for them. And before we get into that, if you don't mind, Eric, I'd like to talk about how this cash piles up in the bank and and actually can't get out. Because I think that's the part that people really are focused on is saying, look, all this money is in this banking system. It's got to come out. And there's no way you can convince me otherwise that when it does come out, that it's not going to turn into inflation. Well, Stephen, let's dive further into this, because frankly, from the things you're saying, you know, there's got to be more fiscal stimulus, a whole lot of fiscal spending. I agree. And the, the politicians have signaled very clearly that's coming. Seems to me like that's a heck of a lot of inefficiently spent government money that's probably going to go into driving inflation. So uh, help me understand why this isn't inflationary and, and how you get to the deflationary view from this. Sure. And that's a that's a great point, Eric. So what QE does is it reduces the velocity of dollars because the Fed has no mechanism to create or destroy money. Now, I know a lot of people think that QE creates money. It doesn't. As we've kind of just pointed out, it, it's the Pac-Man. It eats bank deposits. It doesn't create them. It eats them. So how does the Fed strengthen the dollar or how does QE lead to a strengthening of the dollar? Well, it does that by trapping dollars inside the commercial banking system once they're tied to a reserve asset. And what this does is what I call it creates a dollar prison. So let's move to slide three. And let me explain to you how this dollar prison works. And then it'll make sense when we look at the third slide. And so when that swap, that reserve asset swap happens, the reserve asset created by the Fed is actually held at a Federal Reserve member bank. And it's accounted for on the commercial bank's balance sheet. So the commercial bank says, look, here's my balance sheet. I've got this reserve asset, but they don't control its destiny. Now, when a bank creates a reserve out of customer deposits, it chooses what it's going to buy and it can choose when to sell it. But when that reserve is swapped for a reserve asset, the Fed is now in sole control of it. The bank cannot force the Fed to sell that reserve asset. The bank can move that reserve asset inside the commercial banking system so it can swap with another bank for, say, a treasury security, but that reserve asset cannot leave. And so what happens is this money is tied into the commercial banking system, these deposits, and they can't move around because there's not a large number of commercial banks where this reserve asset can move around. So what it does, Eric, is it causes a velocity of money to get absolutely crushed. And this is what we're showing on the third slide where you have velocity of M2 on the right and you have cash assets again shown inverted. So as cash assets in the banking system rise, well, it causes velocity of money to get suppressed. And this is how it absolutely is the inflation killer. Because As you and I both know, there's two ways you can create inflation. You can either create a lot of money, either uh, even though we can't print money, but a central bank, a foreign central bank might either print money or in our system, you need a lot of lending growth. But what's the killer to that? Well, if it can't move around the system, then you can't get inflation. And so what you're seeing here is as those cash assets rise, the expectation is the velocity of money should continue to fall. Where does the liquidity trap fit into this story? Well, that's a, that's a great question because with the liquidity trap is a dollar shortage. And this is something that a lot of people really don't understand is it's kind of like a black hole. Like you and I could you know point a telescope at a black hole and all we would see is black space. And the Fed says, look, liquidity traps don't exist. And if we zoom out our telescope, we can see that there's a black hole by what's going on around it. And when you get stuck in one of these, it's possible to get out, but it's very, very difficult. So 
a liquidity trap occurs when the demand for money, which is quantitative easing, because we, we just discussed how it creates a demand for money of bank deposits, is proportional to the money supply, which would be the M2, then you get stable inflation. Now, when the demand for money increases less than proportionally than the money supply, so the money supply is growing at a faster rate than, than QE, well, then you get inflation. But where we're at now is when the money demand increases more than proportional to the money supply, there is disinflation or eventually deflation because that gap between the demand for money and the money supply can only be filled by a decline in aggregate prices, meaning consumer prices must fall to close that gap. Now, if we go to slide number four, this is what's called the money multiplier. And from one of your past guests, and I know a very famous guest, someone I'm a big fan of, Dr. Lacey Hunt, he talks about the money multiplier. Well, here's actually how you chart that. You take the money supply and you divide it by the monetary base. And you'll notice I've made a small adjustment so we get the proper ratio. And what you're seeing in slide number four is what the liquidity trap looks like. And when you see the money multiplier declining, as it is now, that is a sign of the liquidity trap. When it is flat, which it generally isn't, you know, rarely is flat, maybe between you know, maybe in 2017 it was flattish, then you have stable inflation. And when it is rising, that's where you're, you can get inflation. It doesn't mean you will. It just means you have the potential now because the money supply is growing more proportional to the demand for money. And if we go to the next slide, slide number five, all I've done is overlay treasury yields here again. And here we see the 30-year, and we see that similar relationship as we looked at with cash assets, which is just a different way of looking at the liquidity trap, where you see this decline in the money multiplier leads to persistently lower treasury yields. And when you see the money multiplier rising, it has the potential to lead to higher yields. But as soon as that starts to roll over, then you'll notice yields fall again. So this chart here is suggesting that treasury yields are headed lower. Now, if we go to chart six, we're going to come back to cash assets inverted. And now I'm going to add consumer price index. But I said, we're going to look at the core CPI and we're going to exclude food and energy. We'll talk about them on the next slide. But what I want your audience to see, Eric, is that there is a relationship here that as we do more QE, that it is putting downward pressure on the core CPI. Because when you when you really understand a liquidity trap is you can have higher prices in the economy. So for example, maybe we maybe the economy says we want higher crude prices. Well, fine, we can have that, but that has to be offset somewhere else. Or we can have higher home prices or higher food prices, but it has to be offset somewhere else due to the fact that the demand for money is growing more proportionally. So when you understand that gap has to be filled, something has to go down. And that's why every month when the CBI comes out, people are always talking about, okay, this is the report. We're finally going to see inflation. And then it's like, oh, but that uh, there was a one off, you know, on this statistic and it went down. Well, next month it'll go up. Well, the next month comes along and something else goes down. And here we can see that relationship between the core CPI and cash assets shown inverted, suggesting that in the future, the core CPI is going to continue to decelerate. Now, I know a lot of people say, well, yeah, but what about the headline CPI? Well, let's go to slide seven. And what I've done here is I've added the CPI to the core CPI where the core is in red and the broad CPI is in blue. And we notice that the CPI tends to follow the core. But I've also added the trade weighted dollar. And the reason I did that is not because food and energy prices are solely tied to the dollar. I mean, we both know that, but it does have an impact on the value of crude and food prices. And so if we understand that quantitative easing and this liquidity trap leads to a stronger dollar, then that's going to put downward pressure on food and energy prices. Doesn't It doesn't mean they can't still rise. It just is going to put downward pressure on them. And if we know that the core CPI is going to continue to decelerate because of the liquidity trap, then we know eventually that consumer prices are going to roll over and we're going to see that disinflation. And if it goes low enough, it will turn into outright deflation like we saw in during the great financial crisis. What are the consequences and implications of being in this liquidity trap that you're describing? And what are the ways that we can get out of it? 
Yeah, well, the, the danger of this, Eric, is there isn't enough money. And that that is what a liquidity trap is, is there's not enough money in the system because it keeps getting trapped in the system. And so there's three ways you can really get out of it. And when people ask, well, what would change your mind, Steve? Well, these are the ones that will do it. Well, number one, the Fed could start raising the federal funds rate and unwind their balance sheet via quantitative tightening. That would reduce the demand for money. It would drive up interest rates, and then you'd see money exiting the banking system. But we know that's not going to happen, at least based on uh, what we've heard from Fed Chair Powell over the last year. The second way out is you can get lending growth. And and we're going to talk more about this in a moment because I want to get to the the third one, which is fiscal stimulus. But lending growth is really important. The third one is fiscal stimulus. Now, I know some people are saying, aha, aha, there it is, fiscal. You're you're, going to agree that this is a solution. Well, the problem is you need persistent fiscal stimulus. You need fiscal stimulus almost every month. And not only that, but you need an increasing amount of fiscal stimulus because what happens with fiscal stimulus is it gets ends up, part of it ends up getting trapped in the commercial banking system. Uh, If we just use kind of generically, a third, a third is used for debt reduction, which is money destruction. A third gets saved. Some of that being in the commercial banking system, which will get caught up in QE. And then the other third is used for uh, mostly non-discretionary. And when you have higher energy and food prices, that's going to suck up that money. So you do need a lot of fiscal, but what you really need the fiscal to do is to create lending growth. And so, you know, as we come back to this big picture now of this liquidity trap, it starts to make some sense. Why does the Fed want a stronger dollar and lower interest rate? Well, how do you get people to borrow and create inflation? Well, you do that by driving the dollar up, So that way, American consumers will borrow money because now interest rates are lower and they will spend that money abroad outside the U.S. system. And as you know, from your many conversations with our mutual friend, Jeff Snyder, and the euro dollar system that he's gone over is the euro dollar system creates a lot of money. So you need to get money out of the U.S. into the euro dollar system where it can move around a bit and start creating inflation. And when you get too many dollars building up in the euro dollar system, The foreign central banks will take those dollars and they will recycle them back into the U.S. through treasury auctions. And then the U.S. Treasury will pull that money in. The federal government will spend it back out. And then, of course, due to a relatively strong dollar and low interest rates, American consumers will continue to perpetuate that cycle until enough dollars are created where you actually can break out of the trap and you see sustainable inflation. And that's why on chart number eight, we're not seeing this. So here's all loans and leases in bank credit at all commercial banks. And on a year over year basis, it's at 0% right now. And if you look at the three and six month rate of change, well, then you know it's headed negative. And the problem with this is when you see a contraction in credit, it actually is destroying money. So it actually puts downward pressure on the growth of the M2, which now puts us in a situation where the growth of the M2 is, is going to become highly dependent on future fiscal stimulus. Meanwhile, as the, as the Fed continues with that Pac-Man of QE gobbling up those customer deposits, you're going to see further disinflation and even the risk of, if this is allowed to go long enough, outright deflation. Okay. Let me just summarize to make sure I understand this. And keep me honest, because I don't want to put any incorrect words into your mouth. As I understand it, you're saying that your view is... This liquidity trap requires that we're going to need the fiscal spending that's already being planned. But if I'm understanding you correctly, what you're saying is that fiscal spending unto itself is not going to be inflationary unless or until it causes an increase in consumer borrowing as a result of that spending. And it's only when that borrowing that creates new money in the commercial banking system occurs that potentially your your deflationary or disinflationary view could be coaxed to change to inflation at that point. That's absolutely correct, Eric. And and we see the evidence. You probably remember the Chicago Fed National Activity Index recently came out for February. And what did we see? Like a minus 1.09 print on that. That is highly recessionary. And that was just after we had a fiscal stimulus bill that was passed in December. Checks went out, were received in January, and here we are seeing that in February. And so the problem is the fiscal stimulus isn't big enough, it's not persistent enough, and it's not leading to lending growth. 
And so now the problem is, since we're having to do fiscal, we're being forced to borrow from outside of the, the money supply, the U.S. money supply. So we're having to pull money in from foreign sources of dollars, and that's reducing the supply of dollars in the foreign markets. And it's all it's doing is taking dollars and trapping them inside the commercial banking system. And as you shrink these dollars down, no matter where they're at, and you, and you trim their velocity down to next to nothing, what you find out is that you can't sustain inflation. You can't sustain higher asset prices because there isn't enough money to keep stocks up, to keep commodity prices up, to keep real estate prices up. There, this, there is a shortage of money. So either the monetary system needs to forcibly cause interest rates to fall to create lending growth, or you run the risk of an outright financial crisis because, well, then how do you get people to borrow money if there's a dollar shortage and their asset prices are too high? Well, then asset prices need to come down. And so that's the danger of this. The longer you stay in this liquidity trap, the worse it gets. Stephen, let's talk about what this means for bond yields, because that's definitely a topic on everybody's mind this week. It sounds like you're saying the backing up of yields that we've seen is, uh, I hate to use this word, but transitory and uh, not likely to continue. Is that right? And if so, why has it happened as much as it has already? Yeah, that, that, that you've got it exactly right, Eric. I mean, higher treasury yields, higher interest rates, higher crude oil prices, higher food prices, all that's doing is sucking up you know, what little money is out there in the system. So what you actually want to get out of this trap is you want you know, lower commodity prices, lower food prices, lower interest rates. And if you don't get that, then again, the problem is there isn't enough money to continually support these higher asset prices. So why have we seen interest rates been driven up. Well, if you look around the world, you see everybody is either short government bonds or they are selling government bonds in every which way possible. Nobody wants to own these things because the broad view is we are going to have inflation. And well, if we are, then the last thing you really want to own is government bonds of any country. But yet, if you realize we're stuck in a liquidity trap and you realize then that interest rates are more likely to go down than up, then what you only thing you really want to own beyond perhaps the U.S. dollar is long-term government treasury securities. So it sounds like what you're saying is the reason that long-dated treasury yields are backing up is because everybody's kind of got the story wrong, and it's going to continue to back up until people get the story right, at which point you expect a reversal to lower yields again. Right. And there's and the evidence of that is you can see the lack of demand. We see that in, in lending. I mean, if you look at the weekly mortgage application data and you see it's approximately down 25% from its recent peak, that is an indication that consumers are rejecting higher interest rates. And so if there isn't demand for people to borrow these higher rates, then it doesn't matter how many people are shorting them or don't own them, rates will have to come down until borrowers are found. The problem is, the longer you extend this out, borrowers go on to find something else. Instead of buying a home, they decide maybe they'll just stay in their home. And so that's why you see, and we can see that on slide number eight, that yields tend to, or loans and leases contract outside of recessions. Well, if I had overlaid treasury yields on this, you would see that outside of recessions, yields tend to make new all-time lows. And why do they need to do that? Well, they need to fall far enough to get people to come out and borrow and create new money. So yes, uh, it doesn't matter how far yields are, are backed up at this point. At some point, they will go no further and they will make likely new all-time lows as we've seen uh, over the past 10 years. Every time there is a liquidity trap, yields fall enough to create lending growth. Now, the only question is, how low will they have to fall to create lending growth? And my guess is you're going to see the entire curve get either ne go negative or very close to zero, even all the way out to the long end. And the only thing that reverses your view to make it inflationary would be if you saw some event cause an increase in consumer borrowing so that new money supply is being created in the commercial banking system by loaning those dollars into existence. At this point, yes, because I'm going to assume that, the, and I, I'm sure you probably will agree with me, I don't think the Fed's going to do quantitative tightening or raise rates anytime soon. And the fiscal stimulus, I mean, there's a limit. We're already seeing that in the Treasury auctions where 
foreign governments are not as excited about lending us money. So there is a point where you can only push fiscal so far before then you either ha- then you have to raise taxes. Well, you know, that's just cycling money inside the system. So that's not really going to accomplish a whole lot of things. It's still going to end up getting money trapped inside the commercial banking system as long as the Fed's doing QE. So the only out right now is there has to be a substantial amount of lending, which is going to be really difficult given the high rates of unemployment and the fact that banks have kept you know, lending standards relatively tight. I don't see they have much of a desire to lend. And if we look at that loans and leases chart, we were seeing kind of a deceleration going into the pandemic. And the main reason we saw lending jump was simply because companies were pulling their credit revolvers and people were borrowing money to get through the pandemic. And look what's happened since. The year-over-year rate change is, is zero. I mean, that is highly unusual. Usually it doesn't go to zero and or start contracting until outside of recession, not during. So yeah, this is a very dangerous situation that uh, will only likely be resolved by treasury yields falling substantially. Well, Stephen, I can't tell you how much we appreciate your coming forward with, uh, we'll call it the last deflationist standing perspective. Before I let you go, tell us a little bit more about the YouTube channel that you produce and the other things that you're involved with. Yeah, uh, thanks, Eric. I appreciate that. So I do manage a macro fund that implicitly follows my thesis. I also created an investment strategy called Portfolio Shield, which is a long only equity strategy. It's it's completely formula based, uh, but it has a very unique hedging mechanism. It takes the weaknesses of asset allocation and volatility control strategies and takes it to the next level. Uh, It's a really neat strategy. And if anyone is interested in that, uh, they can find it at portfolioshield.net. And I've, I've even um, so strongly believe, and I think this is kind of the next generation of risk reduction strategies. I've even shopped it around a couple uh, large insurance companies uh, as a potential option for their variable sub accounts and index sub accounts. But unfortunately, I don't have a big name. I'm, I'm not a hedge fund manager or I don't work for a large mutual fund company, as I was told. And so doors were politely shut in my face. But I think if anyone wants to go take a look at that, because I'm very optimistic someday, Eric, that the right people will see that I've created the next generation of strategies for terms of hedging customer downside returns and still giving them a lot of upside potential. And so for now, it's available only through me and my firm. And you can find more information at, again, PortfolioShield.net. And then last, I host a macro show on YouTube, and you can find it by just punching my name into the YouTube search engine. And three days a week, we talk about macro, uh, the economic data, liquidity trap, and how all this stuff intertwines. Stephen, thanks so much for a terrific interview. Patrick Ceresna and I will be back right after this message from our sponsor. Monetary and fiscal measures by governments and central banks are inflating asset prices globally. As investors prepare for future inflation, demand for scarce real assets is rising. How does the 1% prepare for this? They invest in art. Masterworks.io is the first company that lets you invest in multi-million dollar paintings at a fraction of the cost from artists like Basquiat and Keith Haring. 84% of ultra-high-net-worth individuals collect art, according to a 2019 Deloitte survey. And it makes sense. According to City Private Bank, contemporary art returned 13.6% year-over-year in the last 25 years versus 8.9% for the S&P 500. Over the same period, art had the lowest correlation to the stock market of the 10 major asset classes. Masterworks.io is making art investing accessible to everyone, regardless of accreditation. Start diversifying your net worth today. Visit Masterworks.io to learn more. See important information at Masterworks.io slash disclaimer. Now, back to your hosts... Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna. Eric, it was really great to have Stephen on the show. And, you know, the one thing that really grabbed me in this conversation you had with him was uh, this idea that you truly need credit growth in order to drive inflation, in my mind. And if, in fact, that is the case, that there's an absence or, or not enough credit growth, if the fiscal stimulus that is being provided is only filling that gap, then maybe it's not as inflationary as everyone thinks. You know, it's a, it is an interesting thought. What was your take on the interview? 
Well, I think inflation inherently is a behavioral phenomenon. It occurs when people feel inclined to spend money, when there's too much money chasing not enough really good products and services, and and that ends up resulting in the price going up. We live in a world, Patrick, where we now have NFTs, non-fungible tokens. Your opportunity to spend $65 million, I think, is the record so far far on what is essentially just a blockchain token that's like an electronic baseball trading card. You know, it's you, you are the owner of a tweet. Well, it's somebody else's tweet. You didn't tweet it. You don't benefit from it. But you get to have the little trading card, the NFT, that says that you own this tweet. I think they auctioned off Jack Dorsey's first tweet ever for like $2 million or or something like that. There was digital artwork that sold for $65 million. If that's not, and, and again, it's not buying the art, it's buying the digital token, which is like your electronic playing card or trading card that says you're the guy who's got the electronic token associated with that particular piece of art, even though if it's digital art, the whole rest of the world has the same access to the art as you have. Um, If that's not money chasing things that don't make sense, I'm not sure what is, Patrick. There's also a trend I just read about this week, which is, did you know that there is one real estate market that is on fire right now with huge price appreciation? It's virtual real estate in these online computer games where you, you know, go around the dungeon and multiple levels and all that. Now there's like condos that you can buy with real world, real money, not not fake, phony monopoly money that's part of the computer game, but real dollars and cents. You can buy real estate in virtual reality that only exists inside of a computer game. And people are paying hundreds of thousands of dollars to buy condos inside of electronic games. If that's not an environment where people are eager to spend money, I'm not sure what is. So I don't know how long it takes to play out, but I think we're headed toward a a period of secular inflation as a behavioral pattern. And I would imagine that at some point that definitely does beget the kind of consumer credit expansion that Stephen is talking about. So I think it's all coming. In any event, Patrick, let's move on to the post-game chart book, which is titled Straddling the 50-Day Moving Average, an update from our conversation last week. Listeners, you'll find the download link in your Research Roundup email. If you don't have a Research Roundup email, it means you're not yet registered at macrovoices.com. Just go to our homepage, macrovoices.com, click the red button that says Looking for the Downloads. Patrick, the title looks suspiciously similar to last week, straddling the 50-day moving average. What's going on here? I wanted to build on last week's chart book, which is basically this idea that the 50-day moving average is usually a place where uh, mean reverting moves within markets tend to gravitate to before they re-resume back in prior trend, or often that the change in a major trend happens on the break of one of them. And so we had so many markets last week that were pivoting or straddling that 50-day moving average. And I just felt it was worth coming back to it and having the conversation about what's going on in these markets and what has followed through. And so on page two of the S&P 500, and uh, last week when we saw that test of that 50-day moving average, that marked that swing low. And uh, the S&P 500 launches to a fresh high this week. And looks like we're on our way towards uh, you know 4,050, even 4,100 on the short term. And so at least this time around in the S&P, that 50-day moving average really seemed to mark that turn point. But the other interesting thing was on chart three, which is the NASDAQ, which was that the NASDAQ was the weakest of the uh, the indices. And when it broke below its 50-day moving average, it consolidated down there below it, that 13,000 level for the better part of a month. And what we're seeing in the last few days is a attempt 
to bullishly break outwards and upwards in that move. And this is an interesting moment because uh, one of the areas of the market that has been the big laggard is all those FANG stocks, uh, consolidations in Apple and all these other stocks like this Amazon. And the question now is, are we seeing that these stocks that have now been sort of uh, consolidating for many months are going to now join the party? And maybe is that going to be the tailwind, these big mega cap stocks that have consolidated that could drive one more impulse higher in these markets. And watching whether this NASDAQ follows through on this breakout, I think is going to actually be pretty important. Patrick, I can't help but observe the similarity between the NASDAQ chart and gold. Gold, frankly, was looking pretty darn nasty until a couple of days ago. And then two really big green candles just changing the game. Same thing here with NASDAQ. It was below, decidedly below that 50-day moving average. Looked like it was going to stay there. And all of a sudden, we've got a really vigorous breakout. So it'll be very interesting, as you say, to see where that goes. Let's talk about European stocks with the Euro stocks 50 index on page four. Well, I just really wanted to point out that the euro stock has actually been in a very distinct clean uptrend throughout this whole period. And so while we've seen these corrections happening in uh, the uh, North American markets, the euro stock has simply not quit. And uh, we, we see it punching toward 4,000 here on the upside. Every dip is being bought, very distinct uptrend in play. And it certainly has the benefit of now uh, a tailwind from a weaker euro that's been a, a contributor or driver to this. So at, at this stage, uh, just wanted to simply point out that uh, some of these global developed markets continue to plug away. And then on page five, I have the uh, Japanese Nikkei. And as well, it's also straddling that 50-day uh, moving average. Japan and the Japanese market since November have been one of the strongest uh, markets. And we really have been since February in a bit of a sideways consolidation. I wouldn't even call it much of a correction. It's more sideways than anything. And now we're, uh, again, straddling that 50-day moving average on the Nikkei. And it'll be really interesting to see whether more of these global developed markets really start to join this breakout that we're seeing in the S&P 500 and that the euro stock's already going and whether this will really become a, a broad global equity advance. And that's, uh, and that's going to be something that I think is going to be really important to watch. Bitcoin on page six is not at 100,000 yet. What's going on? <laughs> well, I mean, you might have that target for it. But uh, the one interesting thing that we were observing last week, and I just wanted to give an update, was that every time we've seen Bitcoin approach that 50-day moving average and doing something close to a 50% retracement of its prior advance, it's been bought on dip. And we were asking that question last week, will the buy on dip traders buy the dip? And they did. And uh, what will be really interesting to see now is whether it follows suit with the S&P, uh, not that it has a correlation to S&P, but like uh, breaking out to a new high here. And if it does, maybe we'll even see a uh, 65 to 70,000 print on Bitcoin. But you know what? I'm gonna, I first want to see whether it uh, rejects its previous high or not. But it'll, it certainly remains in this uh, very clean uptrend. So Eric, though, I want to move on to page seven, where I have that chart on crude oil, and you were talking about it in the market wrap, just the way that it continues to hold that 50-day moving average really well, and it seems like it wants to roll up. You know, I, I still, um, I'm a little more cautious than you are a little bit, because I still think there's room for a one more little dip. But I do agree with you that it is a bull market, and that crude oil should continue higher later this year. I'm really uh, looking to see whether or not the bulls can follow through on today's up day. I mean, I really want to see it starting to break out of the sideways consolidation north of 62, just to, uh, to show that the price action is confirming that, that in fact, uh, there's momentum building to that upside. What's your take on it? Well, I think we're in very close agreement, Patrick. I don't really have very strong conviction about a view of, of immediate hire. I, I do lean, if I, if I had to call it one way or another, I, I just have a feeling that after the OPEC meeting, probably the, the bottom is in and we're, we're going to start edging higher from here. If it turns out that that's wrong, it won't surprise me at all. But where I do have very strong conviction is before 2021 is over, we're going to see new highs. And I think uh, well above $75 before the year is over. So I think there's plenty of more upside. Is the consolidation done or is the consolidation just starting and going to last another month? I, I don't know. I'm leaning towards it's done, but I'm not really sure. 
Right. And I wanted to continue that conversation with other commodities. And so on page eight is that copper chart that we were showing last week. And again, we're just consolidating at about a 50% retracement of the prior advance right at that 50-day moving average. This is a place where we saw a lot of markets find their support and break out higher. And when you really uh, put in context what is one of the uh, precipitating drivers of, of reflation or inflation impulses, even on a transitory basis, it's a rise and commodity prices. And if we see a breakout in oil and then a breakout in copper and a few of these other ones, maybe that is going to give another kind of impulse to that uh, reflation trade. One way or another, copper consolidating right here is straddling right at a very important crossroad to determine uh, where, where its next move is going. Yeah, you know, we're still right hugging the 50-day moving average. Do you think this is a buy here? I mean, I've been waiting for a, a significant dip to buy uh, copper mining shares. Seems like, you know, we're probably at the spot where we ought to be thinking about it. A lot of technicians uh, tend to like this moment to try to buy because in the end, they can pretty much stop themselves out if, uh, if it doesn't hold that 50 days. So often they can find some asymmetry from being able to simply manage their risk and their exit much easier along a 50-day moving average. But I mean, I, I really think that uh, I want to see, like sometimes it's better to get into the second inning and know that the game has started versus then you know, trying to get in too aggressively too early and find out that the move isn't happening. And so it's, it's going to be really interesting. I, I'd like to follow up next week with this uh, copper chart and really see whether it's kind of developing as to where the, the next move is coming. With that said, I want to talk gold. And uh, again, we talked about gold in the, in the market wrap at the beginning. And what's interesting is I wanted to highlight that the kind of key congestion zone on gold that is of high interest to me. Obviously, Ole Hansen was on the show talking about that uh, 1680 level where where much of the uh, May and June lows were established. And there's also a Fibonacci retracement zone in there. But overall, this entire 1680 to about 1750 area is actually a high volume congestion zone. And you can see how that 50-day moving average is just uh, coming in from the top toward that. And uh, it'll be really interesting to see whether or not this ends up being a bottom that traders can lean on to uh, potentially start bulling gold. It's very early. You know, one, two days do not make a new trend. And so I don't want to already be touting this as a major reversal. But with this type of a reversal off a key level, it's worth watching to see whether the bulls can muster up something here and really start to uh, to repair the, the price action and potentially change the trend. Patrick, something I think is fascinating here is the level around 1760. We both arrive at very differently. I've got that level on my chart. Actually, it's 1770 right now is where I am charting the uh, channel resistance line, which would be the number I feel like I need to see a daily closeover in order to tell me that the downside is finished and it's uphill from here for gold. You've got 1760 from a market profile standpoint where the high volume uh, nodes have been and moving above 1760. Well, even though my number is 1770, it'll be down to 1760 in a couple of days because it's a downsloping line. And I think that's about the time that we'd be challenging that. So I think what happens in the next week as to whether or not the market moves above 1760 is going to be a really big tell as far as what happens next from here. Would you agree? Yeah, I, definitely. And this is why we should follow up on it next week, because I think uh, one, two days reversing off the low is never enough price action to really know whether whether the bulls have something. And so I think it's definitely, though, something that should be on everyone's radar, because after you know a, a six to eight month consolidation, it's pretty oversold. And, uh, and it will be really interesting to see whether that's enough selling to have um, put in a short term low. You've got platinum on page 10. Tell me about that. And page 11 as well of uh, palladium. And what's interesting about that is the two precious metals uh, have actually been behaving very well relative to gold and silver. They've been uh, more or less in uptrend, consolidating at their 50-day moving averages. So it's really interesting that at least uh, both of these are at interesting turn points for actually continuation patterns higher. And it'll be really interesting to see whether uh, these are leading the way or whether there'll be even any correlation between gold and silver and these other metals. But uh, both of them uh, continue to pivot right off those 50 days and, and are rolling up. 
Meanwhile, Patrick, on page 12, it looks like the Bloomberg Commodity Index hasn't quite broken above that 50-day yet. Any concern there? It kind of looks like it's about to. Well, I, you know what? Uh, if you look at the way that the Bloomberg Commodity Index consolidated back in August and September, it's very uh, reminiscent of what we're seeing today, like a, from an analog perspective, this idea of this kind of one-month pullback that is backfilling a prior rise, finding support around that 50-day moving average. And that is, were the pivots from which new advances begun. And it'll be really interesting to see. And obviously, if oil breaks out, which is one of the major components within this index and copper and all these other ones, if we see all of these really start to turn up, then uh, maybe this is uh, where we see the commodity index make one more impulse. I think it's very premature to jump to that conclusion, but this is definitely a line in the sand where we're going to get a big tell from the market as to what's in store for the next few months. And listeners, if you want to be treated to Patrick's chart decks, not just once a week, but five times a week, be sure to sign up for a free trial of Big Picture Trading. The information is on slide 14. We're going to leave it there for this week's show. This episode is brought to you by Abex Technologies, pioneering the design of smarter markets that better meet the needs of both market participants and society as a whole. And by Masterworks.io, bringing fine art investing within reach of all investors. Patrick, what can they expect to find in this week's Research Roundup? This week, you're going to find the transcript for today's interview, as well as a link to Stephen's slide deck, as well as a chart book we just discussed here in the post game. You'll also find a link to an article from Jeffrey Snyder, chock full of Japanese, and as well as a link to a Bill Blaine article, Things Can Only Get with a question mark. You'll find this and so much more in this week's research roundup. So that does it for this week's episode. We appreciate all the feedback and support we get from our listeners and are always looking for suggestions on how we can make the program even better. Now, for those of our listeners that write or blog about the markets and would like to share that content with our listeners, send us an email at Research Roundup at macrovoices.com or tag it with the MVRR hashtag on Twitter and we will consider it for our weekly distributions. If you have not already, follow our main Twitter account at macrovoices for all the most recent updates and releases. You can also follow Eric on Twitter at Eric S. Townsend. That's Eric spelt with a K. And myself at Patrick Serezna. On behalf of Eric Townsend and myself, thank you for listening and we'll see you all next week. That concludes this edition of Macro Voices. Be sure to tune in each week to hear feature interviews with the brightest minds in finance and macroeconomics. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com, the Internet's premier source of online education for traders. Please visit BigPictureTrading.com for more information. Please register your free account at MacroVoices.com. Once registered, you'll receive our free weekly Research Roundup email containing links to supporting documents from our featured guests and the very best free financial content our volunteer research team could find on the Internet each week. You'll also gain access to our free listener discussion forums and research library. And the more registered users we have, the more we'll be able to recruit high-profile feature interview guests for future programs. So please register your free account today at macrovoices.com if you haven't already. You can subscribe to Macro Voices on iTunes to have Macro Voices automatically delivered to your mobile device each week free of charge. You can email questions for the program to mailbag at macrovoices.com and we'll answer your questions on the air from time to time in our mailbag segment. Macro Voices is presented for informational and entertainment purposes only. The information presented on Macro Voices should not be construed as investment advice. Always consult a licensed investment professional before making investment decisions. The views and opinions expressed on Macro Voices are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the show's hosts or sponsors. Macro Voices, its producers, sponsors, and hosts Eric Townsend and Patrick Serezna shall not be liable for losses resulting from investment decisions based on information or viewpoints presented on Macro Voices. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com and by funding from Fourth Turning Capital Management, LLC. For more information, visit MacroVoices.com. <laughs>